What is up, people of the internet? Welcome back to another episode of the Waveform Podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Marquez. I'm Andrew. And I'm David. And uh, this week, we've got a mysterious product that we want to talk about. It's sort of a weird one, but it exists in real life, and you've already seen it if you're watching this podcast. Trust me. Uh, we've also got uh, Google Pixel leaks. Surprise, surprise. I know that doesn't happen very much. <laughs> and uh, also, we'll wrap it up with Google finally announcing some of its plans to challenge Microsoft and ChatGPT. But first of all, can we talk about the moon for a second? And how the moon landing was fake. You still believe in the moon? <laughs> oh. I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> I think um, gotta get out of here. The whole the whole internet collectively had like a wave of um, this Samsung moon photo story. It kind of just washed over the internet for like a week. I made a video sort of breaking it down, explaining what's happening. Uh, to rewind a little bit, uh, Galaxy S23 Ultra has a 100x space zoom mm -hmm. and it's not the first one i think the s21 ultra was the first one to have or s20 ultra s20 ultra was the first was one to have a space, space zoom yeah, yeah. space zoom mm -hmm. and so space zoom you know interesting name but the idea is you can zoom in 100x to things really really far away and what's further away than space you want to take pictures of things in space um and in some of their earliest and most interesting advertising zoom in on the moon take a picture of the moon cool um so that's what people have been doing uh, for years. And I think in the past, we re realized that Huawei, they were accused of faking their moon photos, mm -hmm. which they, you know people would zoom in really far on the moon on some Huawei phones, and they'd take a photo of a blurry moon, and then somehow their photo would be really detailed and be like, what's going on here? And that had, a, that had its old wave. That already washed over the internet. Yeah, that was the P30 series, which mm -hmm. was like the first phone with that periscope camera. Yeah. And so that they made a huge deal that you could actually get that close to the moon. Yeah. And there was a huge controversy over whether that they were faking it or not. And then there's this whole section of the internet that's like, look at how bad the iPhone's camera is. It's just a blob on the iPhone. Yeah. And then so that comparison always happens. So now Samsung has this thing happen where I think maybe a month ago I made a short uh, zooming in. We had a full moon. I zoomed all the way in. I just posted the clip because it was impressive on Twitter and it had like 20 million views the next day. Like it kind of blew up. Um, and in that I sort of said, well, at least they're not doing the thing that Huawei got accused of doing of like overlaying the moon. Uh, but now... <laughs> they are getting accused of that exact thing. So what's yeah. interesting is we had a Reddit user uh, do an experiment because he was sort of uh, thinking that maybe Samsung was enhancing their moon photos a little bit. So he took a printout of a, poto a photo of the moon. And uh, actually, no, not a printout. I think it's just a, on a monitor. On his monitor. He made it in yeah. Photoshop, yeah. You know, put it across the room, zoom all the way in to 50x, 100x, and take a picture of the image of the moon on a screen and... It works. It looks like the moon. Then he takes a blurry image of the moon, takes a picture of that, and the end result is like dramatically sharpened, much more detail than the original image could ever have, which leads us to all believe whatever's going on here, it's fake detail. Samsung is doing something. Mm -hmm. Turns out they've been doing this for generations since like S10 or something like that. Uh, there's a whole page of documentation on Samsung's site that talks about this. Um, but I always thought it was funny because... We, we always talk about like computational photography and I did the video on the iPhone's camera and I did another video called smartphone cameras versus reality and smartphone cameras, they just edit reality. They uh -huh. just edit all the time. And this one particular thing people really seem to get attached to, which is moon photos, which is as far as I can tell, not a very common picture to take, but it's such an <clears throat> obvious use case where people can notice that it's quote faking the image of the moon. It's with AI, et cetera. It's, it's an interesting story. I just felt like that was a fun wave of internet. I think it's like not common in the sense that we don't see everyone taking it, but it still winds up being, if you think about all the pictures taken of a singular thing in the entire world, it might be the most common oh, because if you're thinking of people, you still have to think of them as individual people. So it does have this opportunity to be the one thing that yeah. everyone in the world can see and take a picture of. Is the moon the, and most, therefore, the most photographed thing of all time? singular thing i don't know i mean it's funny because it's tidally locked right so it's gonna look the exact same from all angles of the earth on every single night prove mm -hmm. it <laughs> <laughs> I, I could if you want me to um and so everyone's images are gonna look vaguely the same it's like it's like those um things happen on instagram sometimes where people take almost the exact same photo and then they accuse each other of like stealing each other's images mm -hmm. and they're slightly different but they're almost exactly the same like the moon is the one thing that's going to look the same to everyone mm -hmm. so if you were going to run a quote-unquote scene optimizer 
on the moon, it would be the easiest thing to do yeah. it on. Yeah. And Samsung actually ended up releasing a statement this morning after we put our video out yesterday mm -hmm. or two days ago or whenever we put that out. Yeah. After multi-frame processing has taken place, Galaxy Camera further harnesses Scene Optimizer's deep learning-based AI detail enhancement, that's a lot of words, yeah. engine to effectively eliminate remaining noise and enhance the image details even further, which is a lot of words that mean very little. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> engine. Engine. They have this diagram of like the pipeline of how it apparently works, yeah. and it just shows like learning data, low resolution moon photo, and then it's just like black box a neural engine. <laughs> no, it's just like some squiggly <laughs> lines. Yeah, <laughs> beep boop, and AI then it happens. comes up. And it's like they never. I don't know. They sometimes deny things, but they sort of use big words to say very little. I think the only the only thing that I can definitely tell, which is somewhat interesting, is I think most people. Uh, functionally understand it as going camera sees moon camera recognizes moon camera takes picture of moon puts it on top of my picture like just an overlay yeah and that's not actually what's happening that would be uh i don't want to say more fake that would just be like well, more brute force there was an old uh, i think i saw like a vivo phone that wasn't zooming in on the moon but if it was a picture in the dark sky and there was the moon it was like straight up putting a fake moon oh my God. in there and like way closer. I'll try and find yeah. that photo again, but it wasn't like the zoom into the moon just randomly yeah. would enhance it. So this one's a little more interesting. We, we kind of talked about Dolly when it came out, how you know generative AI can create a photo from static and find details in however much you want it to find details. This one is like, if I take a picture of the moon and it's like kind of red tonight, it will still enhance it and find all the details of what it knows a moon should look like because scene optimizer is on, but it also will still be kind of red mm -hmm. because it is still using my source image and running it through the AI. Oh, that's, they thought they could get was, away with that? They called it super moon mode, so I think oh, you were my. kind of expecting it to be oh, it's a that mode. fake. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I guess this one's very... Oh, my <laughs> God. So for the, for the audio listeners, basically the image on the left, which doesn't have the optimizer on or whatever, is just like kind of like a glowing white like small normal. small glowing white dot and then the resulting image after the photo was taken is a giant moon yeah, yeah. It's, it's also a one times photo down like an alleyway so you're seeing building and then in the sky it's a yeah. small portion of it but it's still like quadrupling the size of the moon yeah that one's a little more that's, hand that's, yeah. that's yeah it's not doing that yeah but i guess the point is um there there are tests where like you can you can put a bunch of like pixels or let's say an airplane flies in front of the moon or a satellite or something happens where your moon actually happens to look a little bit different your photo through AI will still have that distinguishing detail. So it's not just an overlay. It is actually running it through this engine, <laughs> this yes. black box of AI, whatever Samsung is doing. Um, and so that's what's happening. I just think it's funny that we, we talk about this so much, but there there's no articles about how, like, I don't know, you take... Okay. Your face? Yeah, the moon is, let's say it's one of the most commonly photographed items. Take another thing like Stonehenge, like a commonly photographed item. Everyone who takes a photo of it with Samsung's scene optimizer turned on, all of their grass will be greener in all of their pictures. All of their skies will be bluer. And that's not a particularly surprising fact. It's just like the way these phones and their AI process images. They're editing these things all the time. We're just uh, a little more reactive when it's the moon for some reason. Well, it's a particular object versus like a general kind yeah, of grass and sky. like scene optimizer versus object optimizer is like a little bit different, I guess. But what happens when <laughs> like take somewhere like New York city, right? Where we're now, we now have like six decades of pretty constant photography in a pretty limited area. Mm -hmm. Like at what point can these, like a company like Apple or Google that has access to these giant amounts of photo sets with location data, just start to know what everything looks oh, like yeah. from every angle. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, and then that doesn't that sort of blur the line between scene optimizer and object optimizer? Like if it, it was like, oh, I've seen like 10,000 pictures from this exact intersection. I know that at 2 p.m. the light hits this building and makes it look crazy. So I'm just going to like do that. Do that. Yeah. 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 I think um, when I think about that, it's it's the what is a photo question. There's uh, photos of objects and photos of like people and scenes yeah 
And I think if like you have a billion images of say the Empire State Building from 42nd Street and someone takes a photo from that spot just like everybody else did, your phone recognizes it and sharpens up the windows and does the thing that it knows it's supposed to look like, I wouldn't be mad because that's actually reality uh -huh. is what you're getting closer to. But where I would get kind of weirded out is if it's like a group of my friends around the campfire and then the phone's like, oh, I know what your friend's face around the campfire is supposed to look like and changes it. Yeah. Like, I want to remember the moment, not the object. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I was going to say, like, at one at one point, your phone basically becomes a search engine like that. That uh, example oh. with 42nd Street. Yeah, we talked. <clears> about if that. you took a photo of 42nd Street, but it's like. Oh, it's a cloudy day, but this actually looks the best when the sun is hitting it because it's 7 p.m. And so we're just going to overlay what it looked like at 7 p.m. in someone else's photo. Uh, <clears throat> Your phone becomes a search engine at that point. It's searching Google Images and then just basically just kind of overlaying. Luminar AI, like yeah, giving so when, you a sky replace. Yeah, images. like when you take a photo, it's less about taking the photo and it's more about searching a database and showing people that you are at this location that exists. I think it should always aim to improve the photo towards reality, not towards like better looking, if that makes sense. Like if I take a photo and it's cloudy, I don't want it to add golden hour. Like I want it to be more accurate because it knows what cloudy is supposed to look like and yeah. I'm actually in a cloudy scene. So I don't want it to enhance it and make it look better or different. Cause we talked about this with the iPhone thing where it's like, it lights your face yeah. evenly, even though there's right. no light on your face. Remember how like, terrible that picture of me was? Yeah, at yeah. night. And we're like, that's that doesn't look right because that's right. not what real life looks like. I would always want it to enhance towards natural, towards reality. And I think it gets kind of weird. Like the moon one is technically, technically enhancing it to be more accurate. Right, I guess. It's like it's making your photo yeah. better. Everyone's yeah. photo of the moon more or less should look the same because we all see the same moon. I just don't want them to get to like enhancing it and making it look different. Yeah. Counterpoint, the majority of people buying these phones do want that. I was just going to say, <laughs> from a marketing uh, perspective, they absolutely the moon, want your photo to my, look better. I want my face to look better in photos. If it's I, a cloudy day and it could be golden hour in front of the Empire State Building, they're going to make it golden hour in front of the Empire this State is, Building. This is really interesting. You, you've seen this TikTok face filter thing that's going around? Have you guys I seen mean, this? I don't have Snapchat. TikTok because I'm a boomer. Oh, wait, wait, which Okay, so one? there's a new face, there's a new glamour filter in TikTok that is actually used, it's not an overlay anymore. It's, it's a little different. It's actually generative AI. AI. Oh no! And so it looks That's, at your yeah. face, and so you know how on Snapchat, if you like cover half your face, it like glitches out and disappears. Mm -hmm. On this one, you can obscure parts of your face, and it still perfectly applies the rest of the filter. It's called the glamour filter, and people are universally weirded out by this. Mm -hmm. Like everyone's using it and trying it and getting weirded out, and that's the theme is because it looks like a super enhanced version of you. So I don't, I don't think people actually want things to look like super enhanced. It's a little weird. They in, just want it to look accurate. In one month, no one will be weirded out. And I was going to say. Everyone will be using it. I think in, people do want to look super mm -hmm. enhanced. In two months, everyone will just be wearing AR glasses and we'll just see it applied to everyone. In the <laughs> Which like the makeup <laughs> industry will collapse and it'll just be AI AR, filters. Yeah. AR music. Are you trying to glamour? Right now? The glamour filter? I'm pretty hot. <laughs> I mean, we already knew that. Do I have the glamour this. filter on Maya? Wait, I want to screen yeah. record this. Dude, I just have the glamour filter in so real life. Shiny. So. It really does. Like, it makes my eyebrows look super clean and like I just and, like, got cover one of your eyes with your hand and it just goes oh yeah it's fine Alice like looks like a model that's so interesting it has, very yeah. weird very get weird. ready for our mental health crisis to get even worse it's like it's of I'm course saying. it's TikTok that pulls about? us off <laughs> it's TikTok so yeah, it's like Snapchat just does talk this that too. Enough. Snapchat does the Snapchat does the overlay stuff and they'll probably start doing AI generative filters too do people want that? I don't know. Yes, mm -hmm. they do. I feel like two years. <laughs> yes, they do. And then it will be horrible for Maybe society they, in okay. about a year. Do they want a subtly enhanced version or do they just want the golden hour? They want crazy. They want the crazy. 110%. Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's not the reaction. It's Online dating right is going to suck soon. I think the <sighs> reason it's getting that reaction is because people are like, being re like people will be reactive about this kind of technology, but at the end of the day, people are going to use it mm -hmm. every single day. Even if you just take mm -hmm. one step back, like to the photos we're taking, though, like every single photo we take of our face is getting like the remember the yeah. Pixel Six, how over sharpened it was. Like that's not much different than this moonshot. Like yeah, clarity one hundred. Just yeah. like mm -hmm. that's what the moonshot really feels like it's doing, and that's what Which it's I'm doing to our faces, or it's smoothing it so then all of the wrinkles are going away. Like. 
I prefer it's very similar. Yeah, I guess th those are in opposite directions though. The sharpening is yes. is theoretically more real, more realistic, and the smoothening is less realistic. Smooth smoothening, smooth smoothing, smoothing. smoothing yeah. The smooth yeah. smoothing. The smooth. <laughs> the smoothie is less realistic. I mean, sharpening is not necessarily it more can, realistic. And get to the point of. Less it just depends realistic. on like what level of sharpness and contrast our eyes see. Right. It's all based on like. I think our eyes see much more than a camera typically sees. So whenever you can enhance what a camera sees to get more of the detail that your eyes see, like when you look up at the moon in real life, you you see the craters and you see the moon. So when you point the camera at the moon because you yeah, want to capture softer. the moon, you wish it wasn't a blob. You wish you yeah, were huh. getting what your eyes were seeing. Yeah. So I think I like I, I personally want to get more of what my eyes are seeing. For sure. Ideally. Yeah. As a tool, I think it's kind of cool because zoom in general on phones is pretty terrible. So like these super zoom into the moon doing that is cool. I hope it can get to the point where if I'm actually zooming in and trying to be like, I saw a grizzly bear at this park and like. Yeah. I don't want to get anywhere close to it, but it, now it's just this like brown blur on my yeah. phone. Like, yeah. if they can enhance it. that, it'll be pretty cool. Don't Zoom overlay in. a bear on it. But it's going to overlay a bear gonna... <laughs> eating salmon because that's what bears <laughs> yeah. do. Yeah. In the middle of the woods with no water nearby. Yeah, that's... yeah. yeah. So now we're just making generative art instead of taking pictures. <laughs> it's just Dolly. Sick. Yeah, <laughs> soon we'll just get the Dolly phone, the open AI phone, yeah. where it texts all your friends for you because it knows what you would text like. <laughs> oh, it God. takes pictures for you because it knows what your pictures would look I like. I have a lot to say about that later in the episode, so okay. Perfect. stay tuned. <laughs> you guys might have been wondering earlier when I talked about this crazy, wacky product that you've already seen if you're watching the podcast. Oh, I forgot that we brought that up. Yeah. Uh, it's this. It's right here. Right. It's on my wrist. Um, this, if you're an audio listener, would be a pretty good time to switch to video because this is going to be hard to explain or demonstrate. Sorry, if not, Derek. <laughs> Sorry, Derek. Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, Derek. Derek. Who's Derek? Who's Derek? My bad, Derek. He's my favorite. He is someone, he's a friend of mine who admitted that he only listens to the audio version of the podcast. <sighs> Derek. Derek. I mean, no, a, lot, no, no. a lot of people no. do that. No, yeah, they do. I it's, see you guys. You're fine. It's a podcast. It's, it's, I, I get it. Have Thank we you. explained what Thank it is you, yet? Derek. No, but okay. I, I want to. Okay. I'll try for audio people. <laughs> I'll try. I'm wearing a Huawei watch, smart watch, and it looks like a pretty normal watch. It's, it's a, it's a thicker one. And if you were wearing it like me, you'd feel it's a little heavier than normal. Uh, but it's a smart watch. It's got a nice big circular display. It's got metal all the way around. It's got one button on the side and it's got a metal watch strap. And oh my God, it opens up. You already forgot how to open. <laughs> and, and if you can see that there's, there's going to be a dope tech video probably soon by the time this goes up that also shows these. Um, but you open it up and there's earbuds inside. There's earbuds inside and you just pop them out. I was going to put it in my ear as if I could Your put them on my headphones. So yeah. uh, but these little tiny bullet capsule there is like the size of I could a pill. That. It's the yeah. size of an actual pill. Like yeah. Max that's Mac is underneath pill. this right now. He could classically so he would think that's food. He would think that's food. <laughs> so these sort of magnetize into the top and they snap back down into the watch. I had very low expectations for this. And it's because my theory about two-in-one devices, and I'm sure many people have experienced this, is when you try to combine two different categories of products into one product, something's got to be worse. Usually both. Yeah. Like when you get a two-in-one laptop and it's trying to be a tablet and a laptop, it's usually not a great tablet or a great laptop, just being honest. But it's two-in-one, so that's cool. This is kind of along the same lines. Uh, the smartwatch loses some battery. It still gets like pretty good battery life. What because, is pretty good? What have you seen so, so far? Huawei Watch GT claims like 10 to 14 days of battery life. I don't life. believe that at all. Maybe we don't believe it, but this claims three days of battery life. <laughs> wow. So it's worse than the normal, but it's usable. And okay. I'm on day two right now. I haven't done a whole lot on it, so I'm at 82% because it's mm -hmm. not connected to the phone. But it's tracking oh. my heart rate, tracking my calories, tracking my miles, all that stuff. It's just acting like a normal watch. Fine. Um, the earbuds... They suffer yeah, <laughs> because exactly. they have to draw battery and charge from the uh, the smartwatch. So that's going to take battery from the smartwatch. But they're also tiny. They um, sound like really bad. They sound not great. They have active noise cancellation. You can't really tell. It's not that good. <laughs> Dang. Um, and then the, the controls, you kind of have to tap this very tiny area. And it's supposed to also be able to respond to like you tapping your temple or the mm. side of your head. Oh. Very hit or miss. Three hour battery life before you have to recharge it. That's so to me, it's fair. like, it's fine. It's like the convenience factor of you being in the airport and you get a phone call and you just want to grab it real quick. You just pop an earbud out, put one of them in your ear and you're on the phone just like that. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. You're never going to lose your earbud case because guess what? You're wearing it. Mm -hmm. That's cool. But 
I'm not about to sit down and like listen and watch a movie on these earbuds. This is not like for the for the long term high quality listening experience. This is just like a convenience play. Right. And so for that, it was better than I expected. But I would still never get them. Can yeah. we? Also, they have to be used on Huawei phones. This particular one, yeah. It it's has wa- to. It's a Huawei product oh. that pairs with a Huawei phone. Yeah. Can we compare thickness here? We've got three pretty. This is weird watch. for Here's audio a regular listeners. watch. So that's sorry, audio listeners. We'll say it out loud. We have a Apple Watch Ultra, a Garmin Epix Gen Two, and then what is it? Huawei? Huawei Watch Buds. Watch Buds. So it's funny because the watch is called Watch Buds. Yeah. But yeah. It's the Watch Buds. Yeah. It's. It's about the same thickness as your Garmin. It's actually a little bit I would say with chunkier the than bottom of it. No, it's it's thicker. It's thicker. <laughs> it's thicker. Yeah. But it's got the shape of a normal Huawei smartwatch. It's it doesn't look crazy on my wrist. It looks like a normal It big, looks big. It looks yeah. like a big premium smartwatch on my wrist. It's not it doesn't look out of place. I'm actually kind of impressed that it doesn't look ridiculous and it opens up and there's earbuds inside and you would never think that looking at them. I actually kind of want to do one of those one of those videos. I always want to do these videos where you go into New York City and you hand someone a tech product and you're like, tell me about it. What do you think? And I would do that with these and I don't think anyone would think there's earbuds inside. <laughs> Nobody would Why think there's earbuds you? inside. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, like I've wanted to do that video with promotion and give people like an iPhone, one with promotion on and one with promotion off and be like, swipe around. How do you feel about the screen? And just see if anybody notices because yeah. I always have this theory that people notice as soon as they figure out what's happening. Um, I don't think anyone would notice. People have big. run those tests on high refresh rate versus low refresh rate, and only a few people notice. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, John it's did like 30% the percent of people notice. John did the like PPI on the XR and the the 10R and the 10. Yeah, and like I mean, it was very even. That yeah. one, like a lot of people didn't really. Yeah, I just want I I like to experiment with the framing of it. Like if you just hand them the two phones and say mm-hmm. notice What's anything, yeah. you probably won't get anything. But yeah. if you say swipe back and forth a little bit. Does one of them feel different swiping back and forth? Then you start to get people going, oh yeah, wait a second. This one feels smoother. And then they can't unsee it anymore. And it kind of, that effect happens. Yeah, that That's a fun project I've wanted to do and just haven't done yet. But this one, nobody would suspect a thing. It's yeah. just normal. Yeah. You're James Bond. Yeah. It's fun. It is a very like 007 kind of fun gadget. Oh my God, it's yeah. just boring. <laughs> anyway, is James Bond the good guy or a bad guy? I think he's a hero. <laughs> I might be wrong. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. <laughs> but before we do, we should do trivia. Trivia. There okay. It is. So we spoke about the Huawei Watch Buds. Sure did. But we want to throw it back to the OGs in the game. Yeah. So before Google acquired Fitbit, Fitbit acquired a company called Pebble. Sure did. They had a very impressive Kickstarter launch. They mm-hmm. raised about $10 million in like a couple months. Um, what year did that happen in? Ooh. The Kickstarter? Or the... Yeah, the Kickstarter. The actual Kickstarter funding. Wow. Okay, I remember I think some I, uh, details around my life, and I'm just going to have to work backwards. That's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to guess. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Nice. Solid. We'll do the answers at the end of the pod like usual. Till then, we'll be right back. Support for today's episode comes from Shopify. Selling things can be complicated, and even if it's just a t-shirt, I say that from personal experience. Andrew, you were helped in like making the Waveform merch. Do you remember what was so hard about making it? Tim takes way too long. That's mostly it. Luckily for me, selling merch is very much a part-time gig, uh, but if your whole job is to sell stuff, then you need a commerce platform that you trust. Shopify is, is packed with industry-leading tools that give you complete control over your business and your brand without having to learn any new skills in design or code. So it covers every sales channel from an in-person POS system to an all-in-one e-commerce platform. It even lets you sell across social media marketplaces. So if you get stuck, there's a 24 seven help and an extensive business course library. So sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash waveform, all lowercase. So go to shopify.com slash waveform to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash waveform. All right, we're back. Let's talk about, this is a kind of a rare story in tech. This almost never happens. But we actually have a little bit of leaked information from a new Pixel phone before it's Mm -hmm. even announced. This is this is wild. We don't get to. This is like (laughs) I try not to pay attention to leaks. I want it to be a surprise. And Google stuff is almost always a complete surprise when it comes out. They go on stage. They go, "This is the Pixel." I go, "Dang, you did nice." So that's all sarcasm. Uh, (laughs) This might be a bigger. This might be a bigger story (laughs) than the yellow iPhone. It might be. This is huge. 
Um, so this time we just got a little taste of the Pixel 7a. Just a little, little breadcrumb. And the breadcrumb is someone has the entire phone already and uh, yeah. took high resolution, <laughs> detailed photos of every angle of it and put them online. Mm. And it's booted crazy. it up. And booted it up and has lots of interesting things to say about it. Fun. Um, okay, so we knew there was going to be a 7a because we've had the 5a and the 6a and this looks kind of like the 6a yeah. mm -hmm. again. Uh, but it's the 7a. The details are kind of just that it's going to have a lot of the same specs that we expected. It's two 12 megapixel cameras, uh, a single SIM, no headphone jack, flat screen, the metal bar camera on the back. If you look at these photos, they kind of have like this really subtle pattern. Yeah. I don't know. How do we feel about this pattern? I kind of think it looks like when you take a case off that has adhesive and it just like oh, left a residue yeah. on the phone in a pattern, but maybe that's part of the phone. I think it kind of looks like the S you used to draw in high school or in like middle school <laughs> oh, yeah. in that yeah. one corner. Tessellated. I, I kind of like it. I think it like adds yeah, a little a to it. Um, I think like since the regular models usually have the two-tone like the a series is always one solid color through so it adds a little something different that Fair. differentiates from the the top model but yeah i don't know it's kind of nice okay Here's, just case slapped on it immediately yeah that's a fact but okay two improvements two main improvements why you would be interested in this new 7a one is the they're saying that there's an option for a 90 hertz screen which i assume is like a software setting that they found yeah, like yeah. it uses additional cool. battery but would yeah get smoother higher fresh rate so yeah. that's i like i mean i'm interested i think it's big also because the 6a was the one that had the like 90 hertz panel but no options and people were right, hacking yeah. ways to find it right. so this is looks like we're actually getting just the default option for 90 hertz yeah which, which i think is why that they maybe there's a little bit of a bigger battery or something i don't know but they've maybe this one has 90 hertz which is cool higher fresh rate on this level of a phone is becoming more and more common the other thing is it's had a glass back uh, but now finally has a, allegedly five watt wireless charging. Five watt wireless charging is, f it's not fast, but it is wireless charging. It's yes. like better than yeah. nothing. Yeah. And so again, in a world where it's like in budget phones, you either just cut corners and nix features or like maybe barely include a feature. Like you'll see a phone with like four cameras on the back. You're like, wow, multi cameras. And they're like, one of them's a macro, one of them's a black and white camera, and one of them's a depth sensor. And you're yeah. like, you didn't have to spend that money. I don't want mm -hmm. any of those. This one is like, some people really like wireless charging. In a world of people buying the Pixel 7a, I feel like a lot of them are coming from a phone that didn't have wireless charging, and it'll be nice and convenient to have it. Yeah. Just have it. Yeah. Trickle cool. charge overnight. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. I'm totally fine with slow wireless charging, if I'm being honest. Really? Like, yeah, because most of my wireless charging is done over a long period That's of time, true. and I can do it so often because I can just pick it up so easy. Like. I don't know. I mine, don't really care. Mine is not done over a long period of time. So like fast wireless charging is really nice for me because um, yeah. I, I don't really plug my phone in physically anymore at all ever. Mm. And I don't always remember to put on the charger at nighttime. Oh, well, that sounds like a you problem. Well, okay, <laughs> I usually do, but sometimes I'm like, you know, using my phone and I just pass out on the couch or something. Okay. And I just forget to plug it in. So and fast so, charging. Is yeah, fast wireless charging would be nice. But uh, like you said... So here's a real world example. My sister wants a new phone, but she only wants small phones. She bought a Pixel 6 and returned it because she hated how big it was, even the regular oh. 6, because she okay. has girl pants and girl pants don't have pockets. I asked her if a Pixel 6a would work for her because it's a smaller device. A little smaller. And she doesn't really care about literally anything except for the fact that it's a Pixel. But she said, oh, I'm used to having wireless charging and I need wireless charging. Ooh, that's a specific. OK, so it needs to be small and needs to have wireless charging. Yeah. I was about to go straight to Zen phone. Yeah, straight to I, Zen phone. I also told her Zen phone. Yeah. Um, but she's really hooked on pixels. Okay. Yeah. Because Zen phone is the closest thing you can get to a pixel, but it does not does have not wireless, wireless charging. charging. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, yeah. I'm assuming pricing is going to be about the same as last as Pixel 6a, Pixel 5a. Yeah. It was a 350. I think it like was that. more. I was thinking it was 399. I thought 6a went up a little bit from the 5a, right? I mean, this is if they add 90 hertz and add 5 watt wireless charging, I wouldn't be shocked if it was. At the top of what uh, they were doing last time, yeah, I, I four forty nine, yeah. Oh, four forty nine, yeah. I would it hope is now it's three hundred dollars. <laughs> it's on sale. Okay, for see, four forty nine, you start to get phones that have like because this is gonna have a tensor chip. You start to get phones that have like ninety, yeah, ninety hertz, sometimes one hundred twenty hertz, yeah. sometimes already wireless charging. Yeah, this is mid range territory. But even with pixel, those, so. even with these two new options, I still think it should be four forty nine. If they're just gonna keep 
bumping the price up 30 or 50 dollars every then it's just going yeah. it's just going to be the six soon or you know yeah. the seven or the low end eight i think whatever. the pixel 4a was the best a phone ever and i think it started at like three forty. they were like 350 at some point yeah they right? started at yeah, yeah, yeah i think it was 349 mm-hmm. and it was like such a good phone that was one of my favorite phones ever the 4a it was yeah. so good it was so good yeah yeah well we'll keep an eye on that now believe it or not there is actually more there's more pixel leaks i know this is crazy no this never happens um pixel fold we've sort of been like anticipating for a while thinking google's gonna do a folding phone every year it's like is this the year and then the next yeah. year we're like okay this might be the year yeah it seems like 2023 is the year we're gonna get a folding pixel phone um and they, there are some renders of it by people who have sources that seem to think it's gonna look kind of like an oppo find n so it'll be mm-hmm. if you remember the n it's a slightly shorter and more passport shaped mm-hmm. um, folding phone. So the screen on the front is, I think, more usable for one handed use like a normal phone. And then you open it, and it's not a gigantic inside screen, but it is more screen. And then you can do two handed multitasking, multi window, fun pixel stuff. Um, I am firmly, I'm bracing myself for this to be another classic example of Pixel is all about software. And don't get it if you're expecting the most premium hardware. If you want the most premium hardware, you'll probably have to get the Oppo Find N or the Samsung but you or something can't else. Get it in America, so right? It's like... Or one of the, or at least a Samsung phone that like yeah. you know is tested from years of having folding phones. Yeah. And the Google advantage is going to be well, it's a Pixel, so yeah. you're going to want all the magic of the software and the cameras and everything else. That's what I'm bracing myself for. I don't expect this to like blow me out of. Oh my god, there's no bezel. Oh my god, there's no crease. I don't. Yeah. I don't expect any of that. Yeah, that's where I'm at. Yeah, but yeah, which, which would make me sad. sad. <laughs> yep. Jinx. Do we just say everybody's sad? Very <laughs> close, close. We're both sad, and that's yeah. all that yeah. matters. Yeah. Counterpoint though, the Pixel Watch was actually really nice hardware. Uh, really nice hardware. I think the, bezel the, was... the software is almost where it like. That's, kind of yeah. the bezel up. was rough. I do think the overall design made the bezel less annoying, just because yeah. it like looked good in the like rounded edges. Yeah. But mm, yeah. yeah, it was good design. I would say that distinguish between good design and good hardware, because when I picture great design, a great hardware, I also think like big battery, like great optimization of space, like all these nice materials. And then with design, it's like, oh yeah, you've got the bezels nice to the edge, it's nice and trim, it's handsome looking device. I I think the Pixel thing, at least with the phones, the phones is just like, look, it's a it's a fine piece of hardware, but you're here for the software. Mm-hmm. That's what the Pixel thing is. Yeah, yeah, but the rumors around this is, is that it may be announced uh, or may come out on June 13th. I think announced June 13th. Announced. Should, well, they're it, saying they might show it off at I/O. That's and then, my guess. Oh yeah, released in July potentially. I-O. Well, I wrote that. I the oh. date I saw was June 13th, oh. which I'm guessing is an announcement because that would be around I/O, right? I/O is in May. Is it in May? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Then maybe it could be. We have seen announced I/O released. A month later. Early yeah. July. Yeah. A lot of the old um, A series devices were always announced to IO and released in early June. I, th- I remember one oh, specifically right. that was in July. One That's because was it late. got pushed. It was okay, yeah, yeah. yeah so the the four A got pushed to August. Okay. So then and maybe then the five A came out in July. Cool. Then maybe it is released June thirteenth. That'd, That'd be dope. Be awesome. That'd be dope. Yeah, if we got an A series and a fold in June. I was gonna say like the Pixel Fold feels like one of those things that has been rumored for literal years and years and years like the just, watch ju- like the watch just like the uh apple mixed reality headset mm. it they both seem like these products that are like literally never going to come out but people talk about them all the time also like the apple car even though that's yeah, gonna be a long gonna time coming forever but it would be really amazing if both the pixel fold and the mixed real the apple mixed reality headset got actually came out in 2023 that would be kind of sick yeah i think that would be longer odds we but would enjoy still it. could happen yeah the rumors point to like tim cook going it needs to be out this year so yeah. that'd be cool counterpoint we'd have a lot less to talk about on the podcast if both of them actually released how are we going to talk about rumors and speculation <laughs> oh we just if they talk actually about the next release gen. <laughs> yeah the next generation <laughs> yeah i mean we already are talking about the second generation apple mixed reality headset so. yeah <laughs> true yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> speaking of next gen there are yet more pixel rumors oh my god <laughs> because of course we need to have a pixel 8 and 8 pro this year mm-hmm. that's yeah. of course this week we got every single pixel that is going to come out this <laughs> yeah. year we got renders and rumors about isn't that funny pixel things leaking that usually 
That's weird. <laughs> this reminds me of it's weird. We watched the Eddie Burback video, right? Where he's like, what if there were 10 restaurants? I lied. There's this many. It's <laughs> yeah. like, we have a leak. I lied. There's, There's more. Three. Yeah. So Pixel 8 and 8 Pro we're expecting. It's actually not too much, but I think the one thing that caught my eye from Twitter is 8 Pro flat screen. Mm. That's really all I'm here for. I, that's all that matters. <laughs> yeah, that's so, great. You pre-ordered it already. I basically <laughs> have, like verbally, this is my commitment, Google. <laughs> get me one. Phone of the I'll, year I'll already. I'll give you the dollars that you are going to charge for it. Um, yeah, I think the, the sort of first two generations of the Pixel having that curved outer on the on the pro anyway yeah um i would always use the pro because it has a higher refresh rate because it has a telephoto camera but i would i would always wish it had the flat screen of the non-pro because mm -hmm. i actually low-key like that a little more now same and i think this is this is the first year we're expecting flat on both what if there's a chance we got flat screen on the pro and 120 hertz on the regular that would be really hard to sell the pro because <laughs> remember, Fair. every time the oh, comes no, out, I don't want to get into this again. We can save getting I, <laughs> destroyed I'll, later. I'll then. summarize it. I'll compress <laughs> it for you. The only difference between the Pixel and the Pixel Pro is higher refresh rate, bigger battery, bigger screen, telephoto camera. That's basically it. I think David's saying the A Pro is a bad buy. What? You, you're just putting words in his mouth. I've not said a single word. <laughs> Everyone tweet at David. Leave me alone. <laughs> God. Team Pixel's out for you right oh now. They're coming to get I you. I never said a single thing. No, this is I am I'm excited about that. I think we'll look forward to all these Pixel phones this year. Who I don't think we're gonna get any more leaks. Usually Pixel stuff is really sealed, like tight. So I think this is about all we can expect to get. Collapse. So Probably not going to see any more of this, so really? enjoy it while you can. Run this joke into the ground. What's enjoy this? <laughs> <laughs> I would not have been shocked at all. <laughs> okay, that's a great place for a break, um, which means we should do one more trivia question. <clears throat> all right. In 2007, a company called Polymer Vision released an e-reader with a rollable screen. A rollable screen in 2007. I know. Was this device called A, the Redius, B, the Roller Scroller, or C, the Scrollio? I know how excited you were to make that question. All right, I think we're all going to attempt to picture this device in our heads. We'll see how successful we are. We'll be back after the break. <laughs> Okay, welcome back, guys. Uh, so we have some new information about Google's basically chat GPT slash generative AI workspace stuff. Uh, they are now officially integrating generative AI into basically all of Google workspace. It's about time. Yeah. So this is their yeah. competitor to all of uh, Microsoft integrating stuff into Office. Uh, and there's a lot here, actually. There's like a lot here. They're integrating yep. it into Gmail, into Docs, into Google Slides, um, pretty much everything that Microsoft had. But there's a lot of really interesting features. Uh, for example, you can say like, help me write an email about this, and it'll just write the whole email. That's what I was hoping for. That's exactly <laughs> what I was hoping for. Because I was going to wait for an email client to do this first and like add a text generation thing where it could just be like, write me an excuse to not go to work on Thursday. And uh -huh. then it would just type this amazing email and you just hit send. Uh -huh. And then we're going like, to start testing. They start charging. <laughs> <laughs> they start charging a fee because they can write your emails for you. Yeah. Uh, so now Google's going to do it and it's going to be free. Love that. Yeah. The official, the official list that they say is they have draft reply, summarize and prioritize your Gmail, um, brainstorm, proofread, write and rewrite in docs, bring your creative vision to life with auto generated images, audio and video in slides. Oh, uh, go from raw data to insights and analysis via auto completion formula generation and contextual categorization and sheets. Generate new backgrounds and capture notes and meet, and enable workflows for getting things done in chat. Oh, the cap Wait. the the Google Meet notes thing. I think they had already awesome. said something about that. Where yeah. you're on a meeting and it's taking notes about the meeting yeah. for you, which is great. That's, I love that. That's okay. sweet. Yeah, some of these are really really helpful. Some of these I'm a little bit concerned about. Which um, ones are you concerned about? I'm a little bit concerned about the ones where it's writing emails for you. I'm mm -hmm. a little bit concerned about the ones where, like, one of their examples is writing a job listing. I'm just a little bit concerned that, like, the less effort people are going to have to put into these systems to generate a lot of more information, the less likely they're going to be to actually proofread what it's saying. So if you say, write me an email about this, 
-hmm. and it ends up being either not exactly what you meant to say or it added stuff to the email that you didn't ask for and that you didn't know about and the other person gets that and they read it and they go regarding this point what do you mean and you're like what are they talking about i never said that Uh, it's like you are you're passing (laughs) off information from your brain to an ai and in order to not have to do that work yourself and this has been a thing that i've thought about a lot in the last few years it's like we're now starting to offload storage from our brains onto hard drives you know Mm -hmm to the point where we have to do less work we have to put less cognitive effort in and therefore it's being stored on a computer instead and so now if it starts writing all these emails and writing these documents that say things that you didn't pay a lot of attention to it's like it's like we were talking about before when you're doing a test or you're writing an essay or you're doing a research project Mm -hmm. and you actually learn about the thing by proofreading yourself and going through something and making sure that you understand it there's going to be less and less of that happening and people are going to less understand what they're saying. In the future, instead of like, oh, that was autocorrect, it'll be like, oh, transformer error. Like you'd be like, wait, I thought this job said that it was two <laughs> days a week that are remote. Oh, no, 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 the, the diffusion model. Right, imagine, <laughs> yeah, imagine that. It's like you you read a job posting and it's like fully remote and because it's trained on like most jobs being fully remote, but the actual yeah. hiring manager didn't want it to be so, fully remote. So that'll be the thing is like, maybe the skill becomes training your AI instead of like writing. I think that's, it's also just like giant user error if you're doing it like that though. And I feel like in those situations where if you're messing that up, then the job listing you're posting to is gonna be like, what do you mean by this? Oh, I didn't write that. End, Why of, didn't you? end of conversation. Yeah, like whole, I'm not going to do this. The whole anymore. point, if you want to write a long formal email, like the whole point of it writing the email for you is you have to do less work. But you still have it, to proofread it. It's still yeah, less work. I don't think most people can proofread. Well, then that's. Stuff. I think that's their problem then, and like yeah. ultimately it will weed people like that out. They'll still try and use it, and maybe it'll work. But I think like ultimately, people who are just that's just the same people who are like copy and pasting work online for I, school projects and stuff like that. They're just going to fail those instances where they try and do it. I, I, I kind of disagree a little bit. I think that um, actually it's it's up to the engineers and the designers of these platforms to make it easier for people to proofread the work you know, in the interfaces. And, and I also think that a lot of times people who make tools like this actually make it harder to self-check and to self-proofread because that is how you admit the flaws in the thing you've designed. Yeah, I guess the in this current state where uh, the AI tools aren't perfect, yeah. it is a skill to be able to take the output from the AI and turn it into something fully correct or fully useful. Like that's that's a specific skill right now. And then the question is when the AI tools get better and better and better, is your skill going to have to shift out of that correction and into some other phase where you're the one training the AI or you're the one like deploying the AI into like what it should be typing where? I, I just think right now it is it is the skill. You have to be able to yeah. take what AI gives you and turn it into something useful. You don't just copy and paste it. My question is like, does it become, because at, at the end of the day, you're going to have to have people that are trained to proofread whatever the AI generates and make sure that it's tailored to what they actually want. Definitely. And my question is going to be, is it going to take them longer to have to proofread what the AI writes than it's going to take them to just write it correctly in the first place? It depends on their knowledge base. Like if someone's just a copywriter and good at researching and fact checking, then it's like, you can give me any AI output and I can turn it into a useful thing. Yeah. Uh, but if it's like, I need you to write, uh, you know, job listings and job listings only, then maybe if you just get an expert on writing job listings, you don't need this AI thing that slows them down. They just yeah. do the thing that they're good at. Yeah. So yeah, the AI tool, this is just a fun, it's a fun, like, it's a fun time to be interested in this AI stuff because it's yeah. not perfect. And so the skill becomes turning it into something useful what do you do with it where? I, I, I just think it's fun. Yeah. I do think like in terms of you saying, could it take longer? It'll be dependent on the person. Like if you are a great writer, like you've written for so long of your life, it'll probably take longer for you because it will write it all out for and you. And you're like, go through this isn't how I want to say this. This yeah. is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. But for someone who doesn't write, maybe like me, I could be like, this is a really couple quick thoughts I have. Can you write this all out? It's like, wow, that described it way yeah. better than I ever could have. Yeah. And therefore, as long as I just make sure a couple of these things sound correctly to me, that will be way faster for me. Like mm. 
I, I've written a couple like very short Substack articles and I've had to proofread them 10 times because mm-hmm. I'm just like, yeah. I don't like how I said that. Change yeah. the whole paragraph and it changes mm-hmm. the whole meaning of everything. And then yeah. I had to rewrite the entire thing. And yeah, this is, it's really fun because also using AI as a tool, as a creator is, is interesting now. Like mm-hmm. I, I have a certain writing style when I'm writing a video. Uh, I don't necessarily script every single word. But what I am doing is getting a list of points that I need to cover and say in a certain order and get the facts right. And then the sort of connective tissue is just like in the flow of things. And so when I am like creating something from scratch and I start with a blank page, that first bit of like generating the skeleton of the thing I want to say actually can be done by AI. Like that actually is a thing where I could plug it into ChatGPT and be like, give me a give me a top five list of the most innovative, let's go, most successful tech products of all time. And then it just goes, hmm, all right, it does the research, it finds a list of five, maybe I ask for 10 and I narrow it down. And yeah, (laughs) Yeah. and then I take that and I I go, okay, let me think, do it, which one of these 10 do I wanna use? And then I can narrow it down and pick the five best ones and then write all of the connective tissue that would have taken much less time. Yeah. So I actually successfully in that instance use the AI to help me write something. Mm-hmm. And then Even in the, it never gets like published as written thing. It's just me talking. And then in the video, David's the fact checker anyway, so he's got to do all the, the hard work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, at least it's, if it's about, a t- this is also what I said in the video, if it's about a topic that I already know about, then when I get the AI output, I can diagnose what I need to fix. Mm-hmm. If it's about a topic I don't know about, that's tough. Then mm-hmm. I am spending a lot more time fact checking and source reading. I will just say, like, the concerns that I have around a lot of these features are only for, like, a few things. Some of the other features are actually super useful, like, and really yeah. nice. Like, for example, the fact that it can take, like, bulleted notes and summarize meetings yeah. for you. That's really sick. awesome. But can it unsubscribe from yeah, emails? That's like, the that first no thing that I thought want. of when you mentioned Gmail can already do that. No, it can. It I asks click it you. For, like, some of them, it'll have the unsubscribe thing on the top, and you click it, and then two days later, I'll still get an email from that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. To me. It depends, I have it depends on it depends depends on the website um and but ai should fix that whether AI, <laughs> that's the number one as soon as an ai that's can do all that I want. that's all it. i want yeah um yeah uh i really like the the meeting notes uh the raw data insights and analysis via auto completion and sheets is really helpful because you're basically just taking something that it's like i don't necessarily have this um i don't know how to use google sheets correctly and I have all this information. Can you, it's just a button to like do that analysis yeah. for you. That's good. Very useful. Oh yeah. Um, being able to like brainstorm things in Google Docs, very useful. So I think just like every other AI category, there's probably going to be a large amount of um, people arguing about what's okay and what's not okay. Mm-hmm. You could have people say like, oh, well people are trained in Excel and you should be hiring an Excel person. Or um, another feature that's obviously going to be super controversial is that in Google Slides, you can just auto-generate images uh, and audio. And that's been the kind of highlight of most of the controversy recently because the images it generates are going to be based on a database somewhere. Right. Depending on where they get that database, if it's an ethical database versus Mm. a regular scraping database, who knows? Um, But I would say that overall, uh, this is an example of boring computing which is where you get to integrate AI into something that just like makes your life a little bit easier because Google has had really, 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 really basic versions of all of this stuff for a really long time. When you're when you're writing in Google Docs and you say, yeah. I want to, and then it'll suggest that Gmail. it finishes the rest of the sentence, you hit tab and it fills it in, right? Mm, yeah. It's just doing that, but with way more tokens um, and then a lot of other random features yeah. like this. That's why it kind of feels like a natural evolution to me. Like yeah, the Gmail app right now, if I say my address is and hit space, mm-hmm. it goes, oh, I know what you're about to yeah. write. And it says, if you just want to take that address like you usually do, just swipe over, hit tab, it appears. Mm-hmm. And like, so the skill is just knowing like how to trigger that and how to type and have that save you a little bit of time. And I guess now it's like, okay, autocomplete was just me going press the first, you know how you'll like, you'll write your first word and then just hit the, the middle autocomplete word and it just makes a sentence yeah, based yeah. on what it thinks. Yeah, That's just because it's trained off of you typing a lot. Yeah. It's just a little bit more advanced than that. Maybe I'm just a boomer and I'm a little <laughs> concerned about this, but like, I just, <laughs> thanks. I just, I don't know. I 
I I worry about a day where everything is completely written by AI and it removes every single ounce of individualism from our writing yeah. to the point where like any email, you know, I know that you don't care mm -hmm. when you get an email that's like very, very businessy. 80% of my emails are templates anyway. Yeah, yeah, exa it, exactly. Like all the PR emails we get, we get PR emails that say, hello, journalist, yeah. or like, hello, YouTuber. Mm -hmm. And obviously they didn't even go in and do the work of filling that in in their templates. But like, I just, I am concerned about a day where you're like, uh, tell Michael why I can't make it to his birthday party. And then it writes this long thing. Like, I'm so sorry. I've got a thing that's going on. And it's like, you know, and it's, I don't know. It's this a little, is maybe, it this concerns is, me a little bit, but this is like controversial topic and I'm a boomer. So I don't think you need to worry because soon AI will be able to tell your tone and your characteristics and then I'll be able to write that in a well, very that's literally way. a black mirror episode <laughs> where like the woman's husband dies and they download Spoiler. all his text messages and then they put him in a in a data-based robot here's um, um a maybe my hot take version of what you were talking about mm -hmm. which is like if you just write something and it just works you do you just hit send uh the the question of like writing an essay for school if you put in the prompt into chat gpt and it spits out an essay and it's like a C minus essay and you just hit send, you deserve a C minus because the prompt that you decided to give it and your knowledge of how to use the tools gave that and you're deciding to not proofread it, you deserve a C minus, not an F because the goal of assigning you an essay is to see how good of a response can you give to the prompt. And that's the response you give, given your tools. And that's it. That's what's going to happen in real life. When you get a job in the real world, they're going to be like, write an essay on this, theoretically, and you're going to give them the C minus thing, and you deserve a C minus, not an F. But if you get really good at designing prompts for AI, hear me out, you get really good at getting certain words into chat GPT and it kicks out just the right essay and then you proofread it a little bit and send that in and it's an A plus essay, you deserve an A plus because you did that work to create that thing. Given I, the I completely agree. I think that's I, a skill. I think that's dependent on the thing you're trying to learn in school. If you're trying to be a doctor and have to write an essay about That's how fair. to save somebody's there life, so you shouldn't have to have to take the time when someone's dying in front so of you to look at that GPT. Yes. Okay, yeah. so if it's that's a great point. If you have to learn things to memory to future help on the job site thinking, then that you yeah. should fail. Like if it's a if it's a write a history essay about why uh this monument was important for this piece of history and time maybe you don't need to memorize all those facts but if you go back and fact check and make sure your essay is good you are going through the learning process a little bit but if it's like write an essay about why this type of surgery is better and then you're doing that to become a doctor and do that surgery that chat gpt thing is not a skill you need to be a good doctor you should actually use the skills to be a doctor to get the doctor degree right it's a <laughs> so like very specific yeah. something i thought about is like when these generative ai can start doing computer science and coding for people which they can um mm -hmm. and there's all these tools that have been popping up in the last couple of years like no code where it can just like create websites for you create code for you um the cons the problem there is that if everyone grows up not having to learn the fundamentals of things and they just are able to use these tools to make stuff there becomes a limit of how much you can actually build out from there. Or if you have a problem, how do you diagnose it? It's you like, mean like should... photography? What? I feel like people yeah. don't really know how photography works, but button. they just hit a button on their phone and they have pictures. Well, yeah, but photography, it's like a photo. You can do a cool photo, but like you're not like transforming. You're like, you're not creating the future of photography by taking pictures. Like in computer science, if you're like building new tools or building new architectures or whatever, you still have to understand how the architecture works. No, but I mean, there a, will always be people that will do that. Like you, you are a photographer, yeah. but yeah. everyone can take a picture. There's going to be a time where everyone can write code, but there are there will be engineers that know how to write code. Yeah. I you would know? hope so. I just don't want us to get to the point where in like in like elementary school and university, it's like click these buttons and then. Everything's done for you. And that's how you get an essay, kids. Uh, <laughs> I think there will be, there will, I think kind of like what you're saying, there's always, ha there has to be the general use of a thing and then the behind the scenes knowledge of how it works thing. And for most people in most cases, when you drive a car down the highway, you don't have to know how the car works. You yeah. just use the tool. Yeah. And when you, you know, take a photo with your phone, you don't have to know how it works. You just got a photo. But there will always be some group of people that is, 
I am actually interested in how this works. I want to get behind the scenes and build the things. Yeah. Then you have to learn those things. That's true. You don't get to just use the tool. You actually learn the things. That's true. And so this is just one more tool that a lot of people are just going to use for normal things. Yeah. And then some fraction of them will be like, I want to get these tools to be better. I'm going to learn how they work. And then that's the other group. I suppose it's an aspect of democratization, right? Where like many more people can build uh, things that you would normally need to code for, but the people that want to make new stuff still have to be the ones that understand the fundamentals. It's just there's yeah. a much wider swath of people that are able to create stuff. Yeah. That's a, sorry, go for it. I was going to say, that's how I felt when you were mentioning how like it can do things in Excel or can do things in Slide where you might have an Excel expert or designer. I see it more as it will make the average person who's maybe creating the concept of what you need that sheet for or that slide for can create it. And then when it gets into the professional aspect, it's like this person in Excel can do this a thousand right. times faster and do all of it. And then yeah. or this per designer, when we need to make slides for presentation, will can see my vision and make it into a real thing. Right. It almost feels I, I just had this thought while you were saying it. It's like chat gpt is when you call the help desk at uh any place it's the first the first person you talk to that's reading off of a script and telling mm -hmm. you all the things on a script and then the experts are the uh you got the, through the, the expedited ticket that like yeah. you've made it through all of the steps and they can't help you and now there's an actual expert sitting there that is like oh yeah i've dealt with this a hundred times before like let yeah. me walk you through it i exactly. think the difference is that we're getting to the point where chat gpt has dealt with this a hundred times before it can walk you through it that's the question. It's like that's where, the question. If it does happen, I don't know if we're there yet. Well, I'm not saying AGI. I'm just saying that, like, I mean, especially with I think maybe someday. Like, we're getting there quickly. Yeah, is what I'm saying. I think the closer we get, the harder and har the farther we'll get. If that makes sense, the closer we get, the <laughs> so much harder those Andrew. last parts. Yeah, <laughs> the last parts of getting to the actual human level mm. is going to be so hard that that gap yeah. is going to exist forever probably. it's like cars a little oh man sorry i love the analogy but i'm like everyone knows how to drive a car in the basic form of turn it on foot on the gas and steering wheel mm -hmm. and if you ask somebody right now to like build a car it's just like there is a giant gap between people who know how to use a car and know how to make the car better drive like build the car is that what you mean i was gonna say i think it works better with a lot of people can drive a car, but watch autonomous driving, how long that's been going on. And it is, it's so much better than it was, but it is so far away from an actual human yeah. driving. Yeah, true. Yeah. I think a lot of the Google changes do feel like a more natural evolution of what Google was already doing and not as much of a like stark contrast, like yeah. leap away from what they were doing. And I think that that is good and smart and like, we have talked about before, Google has everything to lose and other companies have everything to gain. Yes. And so them doing that is probably a good move, um, especially since they like low key announced this, like they weren't making a big deal about it. Whereas whenever, you know, whenever OpenAI releases something new, like OpenAI feels like the new Tesla or the new same guy, whatever, like, <laughs> yeah, like they feel like the new Bell Labs, like everything, whenever they do anything, the world pays attention. And that has only existed for the last like six months. Like it's mm -hmm. insane how, ev how everyone is just like locking on to every little thing they do. Yeah. Whereas Google is being a lot more low key about all these things. I really want to try all these new Google features. I don't know when it's publicly launching, um, but it seems really interesting. I can't wait to have it write emails for me. <laughs> Cannot wait for that. I'm, I'm very excited. I'm nervous. <laughs> I just think it's going to be funny when you ask it to write long emails and then everyone who receives the email is like, I'm not reading all that. Summarize that for me. And it's just like, <laughs> well, it's just like within the layers. AI, it's just going like, woo, woo. It's yeah. contracting and it's contracting. And I love how you were like, I'm so worried that people aren't going to feel like they're getting my personality in my email. And they're then those people are going to be like, summarize this. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want Anyways, his full yeah. email. Yeah. Amazing. This okay. Well, we've rambled at length about these. Yeah. Well, I, I think my hot my my summarization take is AI is a tool. That's the that's the for you. It's to cheat in college. Well, <laughs> as a, it's a useful tool. I didn't cheat in college when I was in college. I'll put you it that way. It. I as wish where, I had this. Um, I would have used so much ChatGPT. Uh, last little thing. Uh, OpenAI actually did announce GPT four. I'm using it now. <laughs> that's the entire thing. Yeah. yeah. 
uh, which was in Bing for a long time, and neither Microsoft nor OpenAI would say that it was in Bing, but really? now it, they everyone knows. But if you go on uh, if you go on ChatGPT with GPT four, it can now parse images, which is kind of a game changer in a lot of ways because you can literally show it a meme and say, "Tell me why this is funny." Oh yeah, and it will tell you why it's funny. That's I saw the most that boomer thing to do. I thought that was cool Hilarious. because it was like an iPhone charger that looked like a VGA cable, and it's like this is funny because a VGA cable is a clunky old yeah. piece of tech, and yeah. it's being plugged into an iPhone. Yeah. And then someone at the New York Times uh, took a photo of all the food in their fridge and they said, what can I make with all of this? And it was like, well, you could use this thing that you have mixed with this thing to make this meal, which is pretty amazing. So, yeah, now you're in. Sam now you're in. <laughs> Samsung refrigerators with chat GPT. So I can look you're into at the grocery my store. Smart. What should I have for dinner tonight? What can I what do I need to make this based on what's in my refrigerator and what's yeah. in this store? It's like right buy now. milk. Yeah. Smart fridge. Smart um, <laughs> fridge. Alice is finally getting a smart fridge. Uh, it also does way better on standardized tests. I and, saw that. They yeah. literally wrote a chart I of like all the standardized test scores. Yeah. It's it crazy. can process way more text if you put a lot of text into it. And then um, it's already getting in integrated into a ton of mainstream products. So over the last few months, probably since like Bing was released, they've been working with a number of different companies like Duolingo or uh, that carrot app that you were talking that you oh, use yeah. for weather the weather app to integrate different chat assistants obviously duolingo already had like the owl chat assistant person thing not yeah. person but owl their name is duo duo it is um and so now obviously all the chat bots that are already within these apps are just going to get better which i think is amazing right mm -hmm. i think it's great that you can have a more natural conversation with a chat bot that's already in an app i don't think every app needs a chat bot but okay. the ones that already have them are going to get better which is final great. final question what year of CES are we going to see the first refrigerator with a chatbot? Next year. Yeah. Absolutely, 100% yeah. okay. next year. I think that's probably a lock. I think we're all it's in on that year. one. Yeah. Okay. CES 2024. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, yeah. that's about it. We've talked at length for this episode about all these things, but of course, we need to get to the end, which is trivia answers. Trivia. So, scores. Marquez has eight. Well, I'm falling behind. Andrew has seven. David has 11. Yeah, David baby. in the lead. Mm -hmm. Okay. First question, then the music plays, and you have until the end of the music to write down your answer. So, we spoke about the watch buds, the Huawei ones. Before Google acquired Fitbit, Fitbit acquired Pebble after they had an impressive Kickstarter launch. What year did Pebble run their Kickstarter campaign? And the music begins. The Kickstarter. Oh, okay. The I remember when I had the watch, so I have to like rewind a little bit. Not a lot of time for rewinding here. I think I'm you better of, skip. I think I'm thinking of the Pebble 2. I'm going to go Not with the that. 2. I, I thought the same Man, thing. Because I, I remember to, the year yeah. the Pebble 2 came out. I had to do a little more oh, Google to get the, the original two. Kickstarter. Guessing is so much faster. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. All right. Flip them and read. What do you got? Oh, wow. Ooh, Different answers range. Here. I have 2011. 2014. 2015. You're both too late. All wrong. The year was 2012. Oh, that's uh, what I erased. I know. I, I saw. <laughs> oh my god! I was so. I did have wrote the correct answer down and then erased it. Oh, dang. I need cool. that point. Cool. 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 Everything's fine. <laughs> I needed that point. This is the multiple right. choice one. This is the multiple choice one. All right. Another trivia question. Big smile. In 2007, a company called Polymer Vision released an e-reader with a rollable screen. In 2007. This device was called A. Hit it. The Redius. B. The Roller Reader. Or C. The Scrollio. I'm torn. I'm kind of torn. I'm torn because I know how good Ellis is at making up fake names. Oh, yeah. you guys. All right. What do we got? Well, I was torn uh, between uh, A and sorry, B, but I, C. I picked. Oh, sorry. I was torn between A and B, but I picked A. Oh, wow. Let's go. Thanks. Nice. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I pick C. Yeah. I'm, the Scrollio, I'm glad you guys like, like Scrollio. Uh, Scrollio sounds like an actual Silicon Valley product. Yeah. The Well, I was trying to pick something that would be 2007 
Silicon Valley, yeah. you know? So, like, Roller Reader may have been a Nook competitor. I don't know. Mm. 2007 was, like, kind of before Silicon Valley became Silicon Valley. That's the, the it was first, first iPhone. iPhone. Yeah. Fa- Facebook existed. Yeah. But it was, like, before the whole Valley was, like, startups. Startup culture. Yeah. True. Early. Like, I used to go there all the time, and it was not. Like, really, yeah. it was not the way it is now. But David Xerox Park was there. I was gonna say there needed to yeah, be an this. X in it if you wanted it to sound like 2007. Yeah, some uh, crazy spelling. All right, thank you for watching and for listening, and of course, stay tuned till next week. We'll see you there. Peace. Waveform is produced by Adam Molina and Ellis Rovin. We're partnered with Vox Media Podcast Network, and our intro outro music is created by Vane Still. That's just going to be one singular word in like two years. <laughs> it's like salt, pepper, ketchup.